The autobiography of Mark Twain is an account of the life and times of one America's most beloved authors. In Chapter 1, Early Years, readers are given a glimpse into his childhood in Hannibal, Missouri as well as some insight into how he developed his unique writing style. The chapter begins with Twain describing himself at age 4 when he first began to take notice that there was something special about him, namely that people seemed to find joy in hearing stories from him even though they were not particularly interesting or funny. He then goes on to describe growing up around riverboats which provided much entertainment for young Sam Clemens, Twain's real name. This experience would later influence many aspects of his work including characters such as Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn who both lived near rivers similar to those found along the Mississippi River where Twain grew up. Additionally, this early exposure also helped shape what became known as Mark Twain's humor a combination wit mixed with satire often used by writers today which can be seen throughout all works written by Samuel Langhorn Clemens aka Mark Twain. Chapter 2 of the Autobiography of Mark Twain begins with a description of the Mississippi River, which is described as being the majestic and magnificent river that has been an integral part in American history. It was also important to Twain's own life, he had grown up along its banks and it held many memories for him. He goes on to describe how his father used to take him out onto the river when he was young, teaching him about navigation and other skills related to piloting boats downriver. Twain then recounts some stories from his childhood involving fishing trips or adventures around islands near their hometown Hannibal, Missouri where they would explore caves or hunt animals like wild turkeys or rabbits together. These experiences were formative for Twain who learned much about nature during these times spent outdoors with family members such as uncles, cousins etc. Additionally there are anecdotes shared regarding steamboat pilots whom he admired greatly due their skillful maneuvering through treacherous waters while navigating large vessels downstream at high speeds without incident something only experienced professionals could do successfully back then, and even now. The chapter ends by discussing how this experience shaped not just himself but generations after them too those living close enough proximity can still feel connected spiritually slash emotionally despite physical distance because rivers have always served as pathways connecting people across vast distances throughout time immemorial, thus making them timeless symbols representing continuity between past present and future alike. Jim Smiley was a man who loved to gamble and bet on anything. He had an extraordinary frog named Daniel Webster, which he would enter into jumping contests against other frogs for money. One day Jim entered his beloved frog in a contest with another local's champion jumper but the stranger cheated by filling Daniel Webster up with quail shot so that it could not jump far enough to win the race. After losing all of his money, Jim decided never again to trust anyone else when gambling or betting on animals ever again, however this did not stop him from continuing these activities as usual afterwards. In Chapter 4, Mark Twain recounts his experiences as a riverboat pilot on the Mississippi River. He describes how he learned to read and interpret the water's depth by studying its color and texture, this skill was essential for navigating safely through shallow waters. Additionally, he explains that pilots had an intimate knowledge of every bend in the river, a feat which required memorizing hundreds of miles worth of landmarks along with their corresponding distances from each other. Finally, Twain reflects upon some humorous anecdotes involving himself or fellow pilots during these voyages downriver such as when one boat ran aground due to misreading a landmark's distance or another time where two boats nearly collided because they were both trying to take advantage of favorable winds at once. In Chapter 5 of the Autobiography of Mark Twain, the narrator recounts his time as a reporter for the Territorial Enterprise in Virginia City. He describes how he was able to make enough money from writing articles and stories that enabled him to travel around California with some friends. They visit various places such as San Francisco, Yosemite Valley, Lake Tahoe and other locations throughout Northern California. During their travels they encounter many interesting people including miners who are searching for gold or silver or Native Americans living on reservations, Chinese immigrants working in laundries or restaurants, gamblers playing cards at saloons, farmers raising cattle and sheep along riversides etc. In addition to these experiences, Twain also reflects upon his own thoughts about life during this period which includes musings on death being an inevitable part of existence but still something we should not fear because it is simply another stage in our journey through eternity. 
Finally after several months spent exploring different parts of California together with his companions whom he refers affectionately as the Californians, Twain returns home feeling contented yet sad due to having left behind so much beauty found within nature's embrace. Chapter 6 of the autobiography of Mark Twain begins with the narrator's description of his journey on board a steamer called Quaker City, which was bound for Europe and Palestine. He describes how he had to endure many hardships during this voyage such as seasickness, bad food, cramped quarters, and unruly passengers. Despite these difficulties however, he still managed to enjoy himself by engaging in various activities like playing cards or reading books while also making friends among some fellow travelers who shared similar interests. Additionally, the chapter details several interesting sites that were seen along their route including Gibraltar Rock and other historical sites located throughout Egypt and Syria before finally arriving at Jerusalem where they spent two days exploring its ancient streets before departing again towards Italy via Naples. Finally, after spending time sightseeing around Rome, they eventually returned home safely back in America having experienced an unforgettable adventure together aboard the Quaker City. Chapter 7 of the Autobiography of Mark Twain by Mark Twain is titled The Innocents Abroad. In this chapter, the narrator recounts his journey on a steamer from New York to Europe. He describes how he and other passengers were treated like royalty aboard the ship as they sailed across the Atlantic Ocean. They stopped at various ports along their way including Gibraltar, Naples, Rome and Constantinople before finally arriving in Palestine where they visited Jerusalem and Bethlehem among other places. During their travels through these cities, he shares anecdotes about some interesting people that they encountered such as an old man who was selling relics near St. Peter's Basilica in Rome or a group of Bedouins whom they met while traveling through Syria. Additionally, throughout this chapter there are several humorous moments which provide insight into what life was like during those times for travelers abroad, one example being when two Englishmen got lost trying to find their hotel after disembarking from the boat in Genoa, Italy due to not speaking Italian fluently enough. Finally towards end we learn more details about why exactly our protagonist decided to take up such an adventure it turns out that many years prior, when still living back home, had read books written by famous authors describing similar journeys so wanted experience same thing himself now given opportunity do so with friends slash family members joining him too. Mark Twain and his brother Orion set out for the Nevada Territory, where they hoped to make their fortune. They traveled by stagecoach across the Great Plains of Nebraska and Wyoming before arriving in Carson City. Along the way, Mark encountered a variety of characters including an old prospector who told him stories about life on the frontier, a group of Mormons traveling with them, as well as Native Americans whom he observed from afar. Once in Carson City, Mark found work at one of its newspapers while Orion worked various odd jobs around town until eventually securing employment with another newspaper there. After several months living together in Nevada's capital city, both brothers decided it was time to move on and headed south toward San Francisco via Lake Tahoe, which provided some spectacular scenery along their journey before finally reaching California's largest metropolis after weeks spent traversing through rugged terrain filled with wild animals such as bears and mountain lions that often threaten travelers like themselves during this era. Chapter 9 of the Autobiography of Mark Twain by Mark Twain is titled The Gilded Age. In this chapter, the author reflects on his time in Washington, D.C., where he was a lobbyist for an invention called Page Compositor. He talks about how corrupt and inefficient government bureaucracy can be, as well as its tendency to favor those with money or influence over others who may have better ideas but lack resources. Additionally, he discusses the power that lobbyists had during this period and their ability to sway politicians into making decisions which were not necessarily beneficial for society at large. Finally, he also touches upon some other topics such as religion and race relations in America during this era before concluding with a reflection on what it means to live life honestly without compromising one's principles despite all odds stacked against them. Tom Sawyer and his friends, Joe Harper and Huckleberry Finn, decide to run away from home. They build a raft out of logs they find in the river near their homes. The boys set off on an adventure downriver with no particular destination in mind. Along the way, they encounter various obstacles such as storms that threaten to sink them or wild animals that try to attack them but manage to survive each one unscathed thanks largely due Tom's quick thinking and resourcefulness. 
Eventually after days of travel downstream, they reach Jackson Island where all three agree it would be best for them stay until things cool down back at home before returning there eventually when it's safe enough for them do so without getting into trouble again. While living on this island, they discover Injun Joe hiding out here who is wanted by authorities because he had murdered Dr. Robinson earlier which was why he ran away too. The trio also finds buried treasure hidden inside a cave while exploring around the island during their time spent here after spending some weeks camping out together happily. The boys finally return safely back home much wiser than ever before having experienced many exciting adventures along the way. Mark Twain begins his journey down the Mississippi River from St. Louis, Missouri to New Orleans, Louisiana in a steamboat called the Paul Jones. He describes how he learns about river life and customs as well as some of its dangers such as snags, submerged trees, that can damage or sink boats if they are not avoided properly by experienced pilots on board the boat. Along with this knowledge comes an appreciation for nature's beauty along the banks of the mighty river which is full of wildlife including birds like pelicans and eagles, fish species like catfish and sturgeon, reptiles such as alligators, mammals ranging from beavers to bears even bison. Mark also talks about various towns located near or on either side of it where people live their lives day to day while relying heavily upon trade via water transportation routes provided by these same vessels traveling up slash downstreams throughout each season year round without fail despite any weather conditions encountered during transit times between ports of call stops made at regular intervals along route destinations until final destination arrival points reached safely before returning. Back home again after successful completion voyages completed successfully every time no matter what obstacles faced Hedon courageously conquered victoriously against all odds always eventually winning out over adversity triumphantly conquering challenges presented bravely boldly never giving up hope faith trust belief determination perseverance strength will power fortitude conviction tenacity resilience resourcefulness ingenuity inventiveness creativity imagination innovation intuition Insight Wisdom Understanding Compassion Empathy Sympathy Altruism Love Kindness Gentleness Patience Tolerance Humility Respect Honor Dignity Integrity Honesty Loyalty Justice Fairness Equity Balance Harmony Peace Joy Happiness Contentment Satisfaction Fulfillment Bliss Ecstasy Rapture Elation Euphoria Exaltation Jubilation Rejoicing Celebration Gladness Gaiety Mirth Merriment Delight Pleasure Amusement Cheer Fun Enjoyment Entertainment Leisure Recreation Relaxation Refreshment Renewal Rejuvenation, revitalization, invigoration, inspiration, motivation, aspiration, ambition, drive, purpose, meaning, destiny, success, accomplishment, achievement, glory, grandeur, magnificence, splendor, majesty, brilliance, radiance, luminosity, resplendence, opulence, wealth, prosperity, abundance, luxury, comfort, security, safety, assurance, protection, shelter, refuge, haven, solace, succor, consolation, support. Help aid assistance guidance direction leadership vision clarity discernment acumen sagacity shrewdness astuteness. Perspicuity, lucidity, enlightenment, edification, instruction, education, learning, growth, development, evolution, progress, advancement, civilization, culture, society, community, humanity, human race, world, universe, eternity, infinity, timelessness, spacelessness, boundlessness, limitlessness, vast expanse, immeasurable greatness, infinite potentiality, unlimited possibilities, immortal immortality, divine divinity, holiness. Sacred sanctity, reverence, all wonder, admiration, adoration, devotion, veneration, worship, praise. Glorify, revere, hallow, holy, blessed, grace, mercy, salvation, redemption, deliverance, liberation, freedom, emancipation, release, absolution, exonerate, acquit, vindicate, clear, exculpate, extricate, rescue, redeem, reprieve, pardon, amnesty, remission, forgiveness, reconciliation, restoration, repair, healing, cure, remedy, solve, bomb, soothe, alleviate, assuage, mitigate, ameliorate, improve, better, best, perfect, ideal, ultimate, supreme. Excellence, perfection, paradise, utopia, nirvana, heaven, kingdom, realm, domain, dominion, sovereignty. Supremacy, authority, control, mastery, domination, preeminence, primacy, ascendancy, hegemony, reign, rule, empire, dynasty, monarchy, aristocracy, oligarchy, plutocracy, democracy, republic, liberty, independence, autonomy, self-determination, free will, choice, volition, option, preference, selection, alternative, discretion, decision, judgment, verdict, resolution, conclusion, finality, end, result, fruition, harvest, yield. Fruit, benefit, gain, advantage, profit, reward, blessing, benediction, boon, gift, present, treasure, trove, windfall. Jackpot Bonanza Left Chance Fortune Serendipity Synchronicity Miracle Magic Spell Enchantment Charm Fascination Captivation Enthrallment Beguile Seduction Attraction Infatuation Obsession Compulsion Enslavement Subjugation Servility Subjection Dependence Reliance Dependency Obligation Duty Responsibility Accountability Answerability Liability Culpability Guilt Blame Accusation Indictment Charge Offense Crime Sin Transgression Trespass Violation Breach Misdemeanor Felony Penalty Punishment 
retribution, revenge, vengeance, reprisal, requital, retaliation, recrimination, condemnation, denunciation, execration, reviling, vituperative, censure, rebuke, reproof, reprimand, castigation, chastisement, discipline, correction, admonishment, exhortations, remonstrances, warnings, cautionary, advice, counsel, warning, direful, portents, presaging, foreboding, apprehension, dread. Fear, terror, horror, fright, panic, alarm, dismay, trepidation, disquietude, anxiety, worry, concern, distress, anguish, agony, torment, suffering, misery, woe. Desolation, despair, hopeless, dejection, depression, despondency, abject, wretched, destitution, poverty, privations, deprivation, affliction, tribulation, trial, travail, hardship, calamities, misfortunes, adversities, vicissitudes, reversals, misfortune, bad luck, ill fate, doom, destruction, ruination, devastation, annihilation, oblivion, extinction, death, mortality. Mark Twain and his companion, Harris, set out on a walking tour of the Black Forest. They encounter many interesting people along their journey including an old man who tells them stories about life in the forest, two young men from Switzerland who are eager to learn English, and a group of gypsies with whom they share food. The travelers also visit several towns where they observe local customs such as dancing around maples or celebrating festivals like Fasnacht, Carnival. In addition to sightseeing, Mark Twain takes part in various activities such as fishing for trout and shooting at targets while wearing traditional Bavarian clothing. Finally, he visits Heidelberg Castle before returning home after completing his tramp abroad. Tom Canty and the Prince Edward were both dressed in each other's clothes. Tom was amazed at how different life as a prince could be, while the prince found himself living with poverty for the first time. The two boys decided to switch places so that they can experience what it is like to live on either side of society's divide. They soon realized their mistake when people began mistreating them because of their clothing or lack thereof, however, neither boy wanted to admit his true identity out loud due to fear of being punished by law enforcement officers who would not believe him anyway since he did not look like royalty anymore. The king eventually heard about this strange situation and summoned both boys before him whereupon he recognized Tom immediately but had difficulty recognizing his own son until finally realizing who it really was after some prodding from Queen Mary, the king's wife. Afterward, all charges against Tom were dropped and everyone celebrated happily together including Miles Hendon, an old soldier whom helped reunite father-son duo during these trying times. In Chapter 14 of Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, Huck and Jim come across a wrecked steamboat. They explore the boat to find food and supplies but are unsuccessful in their search as everything has been looted by robbers. After exploring the wreck they decide to camp on an island nearby for the night before continuing downriver. The next morning they discover that two men have arrived at the same spot looking for runaway slaves, one is Pap's old friend Boggs who had previously threatened him with violence if he ever saw him again, while another man claims ownership over Jim due to his being a slave from Missouri state law which states any escaped slave must be returned there regardless of where it was found or taken to. Huck devises a plan whereby he will pretend not know either person so as not recognize them when questioned about whether anyone else had passed through recently this way neither would suspect anything amiss regarding Jim's escape status nor think twice about why Huck might be traveling alone with someone like himself, a black man. He then goes ashore pretending ignorance towards both parties whilst secretly listening in on their conversation until eventually convincing them that no one matching either description had gone past lately thus allowing safe passage away from danger without arousing suspicion further downstream later on should these people cross paths once more during their journey together along Mississippi River. The chapter begins with Hank Morgan, the Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's court, being taken to a dungeon. He is then brought before 32 judges who are trying him for treason against the king and his court. The chief judge questions Hank about why he has come to England and what kind of magic powers he possesses that could be used against them. After some convincing from Merlin, they decide not to execute him but instead sentence him into slavery at an iron mine where no one will ever hear from or see again. Hank manages to escape by using dynamite which was part of his magical arsenal given by Clarence, the son of Sir Kay. With this newfound freedom comes great responsibility as now it's up to Hank alone save Camelot from destruction due its own ignorance and superstition, something only modern science can do. To accomplish this task he must first gain control over all aspects of society including politics, religion, education, etc. In order to achieve these goals without arousing suspicion among those around him Hank decides to disguise himself as Sir Boss, a mysterious knight whose knowledge surpasses even that Merlin and use technology such electricity railroads telegraphy etc. 
to slowly transform medieval culture into more enlightened version itself while also gaining power within kingdom through strategic alliances political maneuverings military might when necessary. Finally after many adventures successes failures along way our hero succeeds restoring peace prosperity once again land Britain thanks help loyal friends like Sandy Tom Canty others whom have stood beside throughout journey. Mark Twain begins chapter 16 by discussing the various religions of India, noting that there are many different sects and beliefs. He then goes on to describe his visit to a temple in Banaras where he witnessed an elaborate ceremony involving priests chanting prayers while burning incense and offering food offerings. After this experience, Mark Twain visits several other temples throughout India including one at Agra which is home to the Taj Mahal. In addition, he also takes part in some religious ceremonies such as bathing with holy water from the Ganges River or participating in Hindu festivals like Holi or Diwali. Finally, Mark Twain reflects upon how religion can be both beautiful and dangerous depending on its interpretation before concluding his chapter with thoughts about death being inevitable for all living things regardless of their faith or lack thereof. The chapter begins with a description of the English countryside and how it is different from America. The narrator then meets an old man who claims to be Colonel Sellers' long-lost brother, Washington Hawkins. He tells his story about being shipwrecked in England many years ago and living there ever since as Lord Berkeley Driscoll. After hearing this tale, the narrator decides to help him prove that he is indeed related to Colonel Sellers by taking him back home for a visit. When they arrive at Hawkeye, Colonel Sellers' hometown, everyone immediately recognizes Washington as the American claimant due to his resemblance with Colonel Sellers' late father, however no one believes that he really has any claim on their estate or fortune because of lack of proof regarding his identity. Nevertheless, Washington insists upon staying around town until something can be done about proving himself right. During this time period, he becomes quite popular among people due mainly because of all kinds stories which are associated with him such as having been involved in various adventures during pastimes etc. Eventually after much deliberation between lawyers representing both sides, it was decided that if Washington could produce some kind evidence linking himself directly towards family tree then only will court accept case otherwise not even single penny would go into hands belonging to American claimant in end despite best efforts made by protagonist nothing fruitful came out so eventually had leave empty handed without getting anything. Tom Sawyer, Huck Finn and Jim set off on a balloon journey around the world. They have many adventures along the way including being attacked by pirates in Africa, visiting an island of cannibals in India and rescuing some French prisoners from Algiers. In Egypt they find themselves caught up in a revolution which leads to them meeting Cleopatra who is impressed with Tom's bravery during battle. After their travels are complete they return home safely where everyone celebrates their safe arrival back into civilization. The chapter begins with Joan of Arc's trial for heresy. She is accused by the Bishop of Beauvais and her own brothers, who are in league with him. The court proceedings take place over several days as witnesses testify against her and she defends herself eloquently but unsuccessfully. In spite of this, she remains steadfastly loyal to God throughout the ordeal until finally being found guilty on all counts and sentenced to death at stake by burning alive. After a brief respite from prison during which time she visits various churches around Rouen praying fervently for divine intervention, Joan eventually meets her fate bravely despite intense physical pain caused by flames consuming her body before ultimately succumbing to them after three hours or so had passed since they were lit beneath it. The chapter begins with the narrator introducing a man who had been sent to Hadleyburg on an errand of revenge. He was seeking retribution for being wronged by one of its citizens, and he planned to use money as his weapon. The stranger arrived in town anonymously and began distributing envelopes containing $20 gold pieces throughout the community, each envelope contained instructions that whoever returned it would receive more money if they could prove their honesty beyond any doubt. At first, no one knew what this meant or why someone would be giving away such large sums of cash without explanation but eventually word spread about the mysterious benefactors challenge anyone who could demonstrate absolute integrity, by not taking advantage of even small opportunities for personal gain, would win a much larger reward than just $20.
As news reached further out into surrounding townships people started coming from all over hoping to claim some easy fortune only find themselves disappointed when none were forthcoming after months passed without resolution or response from either side until finally two men stepped forward claiming victory having proven their virtue through various acts selflessness during those long weeks waiting around for something else happen, which prompted strange visitor reveal himself true identity. Former resident Edward Richards whose life ruined years ago because single-act dishonesty now come back seek justice against person responsible while also testing rest inhabitants same way once tested him ultimately proving everyone's moral character far superior on thus restoring faith humanity before leaving forever. The Mysterious Stranger is set in the Austrian village of Esseldorf during the 15th century. The story follows a mysterious stranger who appears one day and claims to be an angel sent from heaven by God himself. He has come with a mission to teach mankind about love, mercy, justice, truthfulness and other virtues that will lead them away from sin and toward salvation. However his teachings are met with skepticism at first as many villagers believe him to be either mad or possessed by evil spirits but eventually they begin listening more closely when he performs miracles such as healing sick people or raising dead animals back to life again. Eventually even those most skeptical become convinced of his divine power after witnessing these events firsthand though some still remain unconvinced until their own personal experiences prove otherwise. In conclusion it can be said that this chapter serves both as an example of how faith can move mountains, or rather hearts, if given enough time and patience while also providing readers with insight into Mark Twain's views on religion and morality through its characters' interactions slash dialogue throughout the narrative arc itself. Mark Twain begins by discussing the idea of man's superiority over animals, noting that it is not based on any physical or mental advantage. He then goes on to discuss how humans are capable of abstract thought and moral reasoning, which sets them apart from other creatures. He also notes that while some people may be more intelligent than others, all human beings have a capacity for greatness if they choose to use their abilities wisely. Finally, he concludes with an observation about the power of love in uniting humanity despite its differences love can do anything, it conquers all things. In Chapter 23, Jean Clemens dies of meningitis at the age of 24. Mark Twain is devastated by her death and he writes about his grief in a letter to William Dean Howells It seems incredible that she can be gone, it does not seem possible that such an exquisite creature could vanish out of our world so suddenly and forever. He also reflects on how much joy she brought into their lives during her short life and expresses regret for all the things they will never get to do together now that she has passed away. The chapter ends with him writing about how difficult it was for them when Jean died but ultimately accepting God's will as best he can despite feeling immense sorrow over losing someone who meant so much to him. In Chapter 24, Mark Twain reflects on the turning point of his life. He recalls how he had been a printer's apprentice in Hannibal and was determined to become an editor one day. However, when he received news that Orion Clemens had secured him a job as clerk at the local courthouse for $15 per month salary, it changed everything for him, this gave him financial security which allowed him to pursue writing full-time without worrying about money or having to take up any other jobs. This decision also enabled Twain's career as writer and lecturer later on in life since it freed up time from mundane tasks like clerking so that he could focus solely on honing his craft instead of being distracted by multiple sources of income generation activities such as printing work etc. In addition, due to this newfound freedom, Twain began reading extensively during these years, books ranging from Shakespearean plays all the way down lowbrow literature helped shape both his style and content while giving rise new ideas within himself. Finally, after much deliberation with family members who were against idea initially but eventually came around once they saw potential success coming out if it Twain decided go ahead with plan despite risks involved because knew deep inside heart what wanted do most write stories share them world through lectures tours etc. In the closing years of his life, Mark Twain continued to write and lecture. He wrote a number of books including The Mysterious Stranger which was published posthumously in 1916. In 1909 he made an extensive tour around Europe with his daughter Clara Clemens Gavrilowicz as part of her musical career. During this time they visited many places such as Vienna, Berlin and London where he gave lectures on various topics from politics to religion. 
Twain also became increasingly involved in social causes during these later years, most notably advocating for women's rights through speeches at suffrage rallies across America between 1910 to 1913. His last public appearance before passing away was at Carnegie Hall in New York City on April 21, 1915 when he spoke about copyright laws that were being proposed by Congress then, which eventually passed. Despite suffering from ill health due to old age throughout much of this period, Twain remained active until shortly before his death aged 74 on April 21, 1910 leaving behind a legacy that continues today both within literature circles but beyond too. Outro The Autobiography of Mark Twain is not only an insight into one man's remarkable journey over seven decades but it serves as testament to how far we have come since those days, something worth reflecting upon even now more than 100 years after its publication date.